Right, so this is an ad for Legos, which apparently was swiped from someone. What do you see? Simpsons. Simpsons. Mm -hmm. Good. Right. The Smurfs, all right. It's a bit of a, an admission, I have to say, but go on, okay. <laughs> Smurf fans, what about these? Ducktails, right, yeah. Huey, Dewey, and Louie, right? They don't, I guess they just live in Disneyland now, but they used to be, you know, you get those comics, but sort of, they're not, I don't, I don't really know what, right? Why is Mickey not sort of on TV running around? Does anyone understand why that's true? Is it because he's from a bad time and he said bad things and, I mean, what's, yeah, right? But anyway, these guys, this is, yeah, Donald Duck and Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Ah. Not bad. So there'll be a little Lego theme. I just wanted to throw the Legos up there. So I went, now, I didn't quite finish this the other day. So today is about truth aside, right? We're about truth aside today. We're going to dine out on the truth. Um, come on, thing. So these guys. So the plan now is actually, so there were, there were two more stages that I wanted to go through. I wonder if I can actually do this part. So, yes, exciting. So here are your estimates, right? So this, these estimates, we're gonna take, I'm gonna take those and find the, uh, uh, the best average. Cody, did you not write your note? You didn't, all right, okay, so, but there are two more columns here, right? So I'm gonna send them around again. The plan is in the same order. These ones are, you know, there's no game anymore. This is you're trying to collectively get the right answer, right? So you look at what everyone else has done and get the right answer, right? So you're allowed to estimate, so we give you two more rounds. So you put in whatever you want. You can be obstinate and give it the same one. <laughs> People do that. I shouldn't say that, but um, you should, you know, what you want is the average of all of your scores to be the best, right? What's that? On the next page. So, um, economist, you're optimizing. All right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a joy to watch. Um, so this is just behaving well, right? We're not, you, know, you don't get any rewards for what's in the second and third column. It's just a big pat on the back if we do well collectively. So look at what other people have done. All right, so that, that'll go around, we'll, and then I'll send them around again. Just do the first column. Okay. And then I'll have nice plots of what you guys did. And that will connect to some things we talk about later on. There are my ridiculous slide making things. Oh boy. Uh, so, okay, estimation forms. I fixed up the nail thing. I have some stuff about Moore's Law and more about Legos, and then we get to the truth aside. Mm. Truth aside. Very bad behavior. It is, it is an extraordinary saga in some ways, I think, what I've been talking about. Um, and it's been going on for me since 1998, uh, which is a long time. You were possibly born. And I wanted to go back and show you some more things I added here, which I think are fun. Where are the nails? Uh, okay. Well, there was, a, there was a, yeah, here it is. There was just an error in these slides. So I, just to say that I, I patched that up. It was just this piece here. Um, yeah, they get, long, they get thinner relatively as you go up through massive nail, right? They, they stretch. So the diameter is not growing as fast as the length, right? So it's an allometric relationship. If it was isometric, it would be just diameter and length are proportional to each other. So that gives kind of a funny relationship down here. The diameter is actually proportional to the, two seven, the power of two sevenths, the volume. Um, and that's where I just had some stuff hanging around. And then I found all these notes like from last year saying, fix that up. I need another note that says, look at your notes. <sighs> actually, I have those notes. I don't look at them. All right, so there are a few other pieces. Moore's Law. Famous, famous one, right? So an observation that, I just want to add some more scaling pieces. Uh, so this uh, idea that the number of transistors per unit area doubles uh, every two years, roughly, right? But it's actually more of a, uh, um, about cost. You can, you, can, you can frame this as cost, right? So the cost is going down as more and more of something is produced cumulatively, not just like this year or the year before, it's total produced ever made the cost of production goes down. Because we're smart things, we figure out how to, and we want to make money, 
we're economists, we want to uh, make money, so we figure out how to do that. And you know, it just turns out that this has been possible. So Moore's Law has been around for a long time, very, very famous. People get scared because they're not sure if their thing can double, and then someone figures out something very clever, and we're off into the next realm. You know, there are some limits because of the whole quantum business, but we'll get, we'll get to that. Oh, I crushed it. Come on, thing. Whoa. Why would you do that to me? Yeah, okay, all right. So here's a, a paper that just appeared, very interesting one. So it's uh, Nagi et al. Uh, comes out of MIT. Uh, and it's about Moore's Law for everything. So you'd think that I, <laughs> we would have looked this up, but I have a couple of pieces here uh, that, that are, you know, again, pretty recent. So, uh, so we look at how much uh, s the stuff costs per unit to make. That's a Y. That's going to be the Y. X is going to be the total amount, so I'm using their notation, the total amount of stuff that's been made ever, right? Not the last year or so on. This is the total amount. There are a couple of laws floating around, so I actually didn't know about this. So Wright's, Wright's law is that the uh, cost decreases with the amount of stuff that's been made. Right, so it's decaying away as this power law. <clears throat> so you make more stuff, the cost goes down. How does the economist feel about that? Uh, <laughs> so this is for technological stuff. It's not true for, I don't know, everything. Bananas, for example. Right, okay. <clears throat> However, banana cutters <laughs> presumably follow this uh, law as well. Um, they, <laughs> hopefully that X doesn't get too big for those things because, you know. We will <laughs> have to apologize to future generations. We already have to. All right, so uh, Moore's Law, though, as, we've, as I've just mentioned, so it's about this doubling of density, but what's also going on is the cost. So this is this exponential decay of cost. And that's, this, is not, this is not based on how much stuff has been made, the way it's framed here. It's just time, right? It's just time, just going down with time. And that sort of presumes you're in the game, that you're really making this stuff, you're, you're excited about it. And then there, there are a few others, and they tested maybe five or six laws in this, in this uh, paper. Uh, so there's this observation from, I think, 79 by Sahal that these two can be connected um, as long as uh, the stuff production grows exponentially. So if you have stuff production going up exponentially, then these two things match up. Uh, so if you can just stick these guys together, and you'll see this W up here is equal to the M, this M divided by G. So this writes constant for this power law decay here uh, connects to these guys. That's a simple little thing to do. Um, <coughs> so you can, uh, you can separately then, of course, measure, you can just go and measure these three pieces about banana cutters, right? Or whatever it is that you're looking at, iPods. And um, measure these laws and measure the W, the M, and the G. See how it works out, right? So this is an equal sign, and in fact, that's uh, what they say. I'll show you this next slide here. So this is measuring W, this is M over G, and so this is a whole bunch of different things. So um, you know, hardware energy, all sorts of different systems. <coughs> so you can see a nice straight line, right? The zero to one, zero to one. So well played. Uh, and so they have a bunch of examples, and they show uh, how well these things work. So this is price dropping on the left. And this is a, sort of a bad example. This is a medium example. This is a terrific example in terms of correlations. So they do a nice thing, which is, you know, usually there's one plot, and it's like, uh, here's a typical example, which is code for it is the best one we found. And then there's uh, the amount of stuff pr being produced uh, on this side. So these things are matching up pretty well. And these, this, this is showing how well they correlate in general. Very nice. All right. Most of them are more in this category is what that is trying to say. So that was a, that's a very nice piece of work, nice bit of scaling for, for technological things, banana cutters. All right. This is, this is a great, so this, this has got a little bit, this gets impressed now, and then it got another write-up back in uh, just last year from uh, Abersman on Wired.com. So I, I'll bring this guy up later on because I'm a fan of him. Um, Chang Gizi. He's done a lot of interesting things, lots of stuff to do with the brain. But look, this is a great title, right? So it's a scaling of differentiation. So it means how many different types of things are there in your network, right? So we talked about, um, or, in your, or in your system in general, but we're talking about networks. He's going to talk about networks. Uh, I had a, a plot from the McMahon and Bonner about the number of different types of cells in organisms as you go up through scales, right? And so you get to, into the hundreds when you get to a whale, uh, not so many when you're down with bacteria. But it's a very slow growth. 
this is a, <coughs> there's a, this is of course log log. This is a, an exponent of 0.7, so it's, um, wow. Hmm. Oh, I see what they've done. Yeah, right. So if you plotted this on a normal thing, it would look more like a, like this, right? Okay. It's a sublinear growth. Uh, but this is for Legos in boxes, right? So these are box sets of Legos. They got 380 and they got the number, you know, the types of Lego pieces in all of those boxes. Yeah, nice bit of scraping off a web. I think it's about 380 sets. And so you see how they, they scale, the number of distinct types of pieces. And so there's a nice follow-up to this by uh, Cengizi himself saying that, you know, Lego has changed, right? Now there's every, all these tiny, these very special pieces that only fit in this, right? You guys all love Lego. Okay, uh, but it used to be, and, and actually my wife turned up with a box, you know, my mother had a box of um, Lego pieces from when they were kids, and you know, the, the people that you would make are just incredible block structures. They're made out of, you know, parts of the things, of roofing tiles and things, I and mean, it's just <laughs> what was lying around, right? So let's make a person out of it. Okay, so that's changed because now they're much more specialized and your Batman thing or whatever it is has all the special bits you can't use anywhere else. So that's an interesting human thing to have done actually, right? So engineered systems, so the overall kind of statement they have, so they're looking at, let me say some of these other things, so electric circuits, electronic circuits, right, how many different types of things are there in there? Uh, universities, they're looking at different types of um, positions, same with businesses in general, like how many, you know, how many vice presidents, right, you have a vice president, you have da 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 da, military, Ant colonies, they looked at it in a couple of ways, I think, the number of uh, castes, the different types of castes, the different uh, differences if you break them down by size, um, nervous systems, all sorts of things, right? So how many, how many components are there? So they're all of a kind, right? Ant colonies, these are ants, and these are ants, and these are ants, but they're going up through scale. But the bigger ant colonies, do they, you know, what, if, you, if you multiply the ant colony size by 10 in number, do you get, new kinds of ants. Does it sort of necessarily mean that evolution will have produced new kinds of ants, right? So a very competitive situation. And so they have this um, general story. So this is, the num this is the network differentiation, right? So this is the number of node types. This is this, just the total number of nodes. Uh, and the way they framed it, they had a D on the other side. So one over D, right? And which is, which is normally, uh, which has to be greater than one. And so they call this thing the combinatorial degree. So if it's a low D, Right, so it's low D, so this is, it's never less than one, this one over D, but it's getting smaller. Then we have lots of specialized parts, right? Okay, and that's, so that's Legos and human systems. Um, however, if, uh, high D on the other hand, so this is more, this is the ant colonies and some other natural systems. They're much more uh, combinatorial is the idea, right? So they're making bigger and bigger pieces out of themselves, but using the same parts again, right? So you have this little blocky human you've made out of Lego bits. Uh, compared to the ones now that look, well, they look better. Um, so, you know, and there's general claims, right? So the natural selection is pr producing these uh, high D systems using the building blocks they've created. Very nice papers, very long, but lots of other good stuff in here. Whereas engineering and our brains in general, uh, you know, this is the general story, produce low D systems. Table at the end, uh, lots of things. So Legos, electronic circuits, universities, organisms, all sorts of things, cities. Uh, and then the combinatorial degree is here. So you see organisms, this is for something, it, so cells in organisms, so 17 here. The ants are up at eight, so these are large numbers. Um, this is five for, for the neuron as well, so, so uh, the, the neurocortex. So this is you know, evolution producing these things. Cool, very cool, all right? So good to know what your system is doing. So there's a couple of uh, extra pieces, all right. I'm excited about that. I know you're excited. I'm excited. We're all excited. Okay. Did all those things. Let's go talk about death by fractions. I mean, this is really ridiculous what I have to tell. I mean, it's just insane. I mean, if you look at the math behind all of these things, you look at the data, what I'm going to show you, you look at the data, nothing matches up with what, what people have come to believe and still believe. It is really, really extraordinary. Okay. Uh, for a long time, I sort of gave up, I think. But, but actually, in teaching this course, I, started, I thought, all right, I'm going to teach some of this stuff. I'm just going to talk about this. It's a big deal. It's a big deal in biology and ecology. Huge, right? I mean, this is how much organism, and what we're talking about centrally here, we will talk about ribbon networks, but it's, again, it's, it's this basal metabolism um, story. So as you go up through scale, 
How much do uh, organisms use just kind of hanging around, right? They have to run around a little bit to eat each other and so on, do some other things, but generally speaking, they're using some energy. And that, that's all good. How does that all add up? Great, great question, ecosystem question. Of course, there are, we'll focus a little bit more on animals and um, mammals and birds, where we have some pretty decent measurements. But there, you know, we have trees, we have plants, we have enormous amount of stuff. OK. So the history, the history. So here's the, the birth of a, a theory. Um, very, very reasonable theory. So uh, this scaling, and I think I, I, should, I should just write it down again for you. So it's, um, oh, why not? I'm just trying this for my own amusement. All right, sorry. So it's this again, right? So it's a, I think I wrote P, but it's proportional to mass to the alpha, right? So this is the organismal mass. You go and measure your sheep. You put them on a scale. You get your shrew out. You measure them, and this is the basal metabolic rate. I think I've just done something great. And this is the magic fraction. The magic fraction, right? So the Knights Templar knew all about this thing. Freemasons, all those guys. It goes all the way back. Um, <coughs> we'll get to that. Huge. There's a cabal. There's obviously a cabal. Okay. So... They, uh, so, so this, is a, this is a funny history. So there's this fellow called Hoisner, who I called many years ago. He was an emeritus professor, and I'll come back to him. He's an emeritus professor at Davis. He uh, was sort of in animal research and so on. A lot of stuff about livestock, right? Uh, and uh, he, um, he'd retired. He's, he was doing pottery at this point, and he's from, I think, France or Germany originally, and so he'll have another connection too as well, but uh, very nice discussions with him. And he... He told me about this work. It was never actually officially published, but there's some version of it you can get to. He, he was actually over in Paris trying to find it and all sorts of things. So it's, you know, the Da Vinci Code thing was on the side. You know, they're running around as well, and he's like looking for this crazy paper. So what's this? So it's a factory. So this is uh, a tobacco um, plantation in, in France in the mid uh, 19th century. And they were wondering how much to feed their workers, right? So they went and asked a couple of scientists how much should we feed our workers, right? Based on their size. Yeah? Economists would just light up about this one. This is great. We want to be efficient, right? The Industrial Revolution, what could, what could go wrong? Look at these people. This is not the coal mine guys, but they're out in their tobacco plantation. Uh, and so they said, well, spherical cow sort of thing, or ellipsoid cow story, right? So you imagine here is, actually it works much better today, right? In, modern, in the modern uh, Western societies. All right, so you have your people uh, scaling up. And they had this notion of um, this, which we talked about the other day, the, 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 um, the you know, heat being given off through your body. So that th here's this very simple idea that it should be proportional to surface area, which is it's then proportional to volume to the two thirds, which given density is roughly the same across people, proportional to volume, mass to the two thirds. So it's a two thirds scaling. All right. So there. <laughs> So they said that's how much uh, goulash or porridge or whatever was, um, or baguettes, you know, that, uh, that you should uh, feed your people based on their weight, right? Extraordinary. Of course, they're thinking more generally. So we start off with people. Okay. So Soylent Green is not far away from this. But, um, you know, that, that, that's an insane motivation to do it. That's where it first pops into people's heads that, you know, there should be some kind of scale. <coughs> Then that we get to an actual experiment. This is um, Max Rubner. It was published in eight, so this is this you can really you know this really exists. 1883, uh, and he looked at dogs, right? So he looked at dogs. So this is a hard thing to measure, right? I've mentioned this a little bit. You you have to either measure how much food they eat and how much stuff comes out, right, and all this sort of difficult stuff, uh, or measure oxygen intake, various things, you know. Okay, so he did it with dogs, and he saw again the two thirds worked out pretty well. So we'll see eventually, oh, well, maybe I won't show you, but eventually there is this claim that it works within species, so interspecies you see a scaling of two-thirds, right? And it's not, there's not much range. I mean, dogs have a decent range but, uh, because we made that happen but, uh, uh, through you know, long thousands of years of breeding, but uh, most organisms don't have orders of magnitude, right? Especially the big ones. Uh, <coughs> so that's the 1880s. So that hangs around for a while. But it's, uh, it, it becomes, so we, 
the, the people thing kind of goes away, it becomes very useful to think about uh, this scaling for uh, animals, for livestock, right? So there's all this work that goes into how much we should feed our livestock based on size, right? So I want to have so much hay allotted to cows and so on. I need something that helps me understand the difference between goats and cows. Um, <coughs> right, there's some joke about mathematical biologists there with dogs, but anyway. Um, okay, uh, so this, this is hay. This is a uh, work that's, this is a, I mean, this is an extraordinary m messy piece of work. Uh, they come up with 0.73, so this is, the, this is another regression, the same thing that uh, Rubner done, did, 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 did. Uh, uh, so we have some, right, so you've got some points here, you've got log of m, log of b, and right, measure your exponent. And we know that's a horrible, messy thing, and we'll deal with that in various ways. But they came out with 0.73, so not two-thirds, it's more than two-thirds. Uh, there's some funny stuff in there, they went to a zoo, one of them went, I think maybe Benedict went to a zoo and looked at an elephant and tried to measure an elephant's uh, intake, but the elephant wouldn't, you know, kind of relax, and so he deducted 10% or something. I mean, it's just, because it was eating hay, I mean, this is, that's, it's, so it's just a mess when you read through, and some of this work, it's, uh, it's both really crazy, so there's actually measured, measured points, so that real, it's real data, and then some that's made up from another law that's sort of thrown in, and then a regression on top. I mean, it's just horrible to read. You're just like, oh my God, people. Anyway, but they're just trying to be practical, right? They're really just trying to get some story for this. this is a, you know, it matters. I mean, you go up in scale uh, in terms of farms and so on. You know, you need to kind of have some numbers somewhere. So, I guess. Anyway, people were, were more and more fascinated by this. All right, so we have this. This is the 30s and... 932, you have, and this is the start of everything, right? This is the start of a great religion. Um, follow Max, so it's Max Kleiber, who turns out to be friends with this guy, Hoisner, because they both ended up at Davis. And they were great friends, they were family friends, they went on family holidays together, so they're great friends, but they completely disagreed about this thing, right? So they're from the wrong religion, yeah. Hoisner's religion ended up being a very small one, and Max's grew into a large one. Okay, so... 13 mammals, so 13 data points, this is where it starts from, right? A little grain of sand, you kick in the, in the desert and you start making up stories, it's good. Um, and he, if, you know, it's true, if you, you can get this data, and if you regret, you can actually, it's, you know, it's in the, it's actually written out, the actual points, so you can do the regression, 0.76, right? That's what he measured for, the, for this exponent. And so he said, well, all right, well, maybe it's three quarters then. That sort of seems we could figure that out, and there's a Pythagorean kind of ideal of trying to find fractions and, you know, so on. And there's some other good ones in there, like four-sevenths, but this is sort of not so bad, right? Three-quarters. Oh, boy. Um, <coughs> it becomes known as Kleiber's Law. Uh, he wrote about this uh, in, in numerous ways. There's a book called The Fire of Life, you know, right? It's great stuff. But still, it remains a mystery, and I, it, this will remain a mystery for a long time. Uh, and it's still a mystery, uh, but it will remain a mystery for various reasons, I think. Uh, so now it's known as Kleiber, uh, Kleiber's Law. Sorry, there's something about this Wikipedia article that you shouldn't see. So why is there a slide rule? So his point is, you're out in the farm and you want to figure out how much to feed this cow, then you need to be able to do this reasonably well. And he does have a line that just says that works better on a slide rule, right? 0.71 or 0.72, you can do it, but raising something to the power of 0.72 is not as nice as three quarters. Okay. Uh, I do know someone who's a slide rule champion, and he's like, ow, oh, it's fine, 0.7, you know, you can do whatever you want, three decimal places. <laughs> That's Bill, right. You can do it. Uh, but, but it is, it is, it does seem simple, it's easy to remember, right, okay. So it comes out of just using a slide rule well, right? This wouldn't happen with calculators. And it's also 13 mammals. And I'll show you there's something very funny about this data set when we get to it. All right, that's where, um, <coughs> so two thirds is on shaky grounds now. A little bit, a little bit. People start arguing. They start arguing, right? They really want this sorted out. Uh, right, so there it is, fire of life. That's 961. Um, <coughs> I will say, let me go back to these guys. Uh, Hoisner and Kleiber, as I said, good family friends, and uh, this is from Hoisner, talking to Hoisner. 
uh, maybe 98. He, uh, he said that um, after Kleiber retired, he kind of started to agree with Hoisner, right? He said, yeah, it's okay, you know, it's all right, all right. I mean, but, but it, is, it got crystallized by everyone else, uh, especially physicists, because it's, it seems doable, right? You should, like a fraction like that would be great. Um, <coughs> okay, so now we're starting to move off into religion territory. So there are these crazy papers by, uh, they're sort of almost little books by Hemmingson, uh, where he starts to look at also, this is some horrible slime mold, which has something, something to do with dogs in the name, which is very rude, um, I think because of the way it smells. But anyway, so this is a, he has slime mold, he has all sorts of stuff, mushrooms, moss, all the way up to trees and things, and he draws a line through all these things. You can look at it and you'll see that he's assuming that three quarters is the exponent, and he's interested in fitting the prefactor, c times m to the alpha. He's trying to figure that part out. Which we looked at a little bit, right? Various, it's different for platypus, potentially platypuses and echidnas and so on. Um, so these are really crazy, crazy things. I found them in the Harvard Medical School. I had to, you know, I was at MIT, so I had to kind of be put in a hazmat thing or something and walk and then before they let me in there. Um, it's quite embarrassing. And then I, I found them and eventually I got to them. You know, you look and you look, you, you know, guys don't know about libraries, but you have to, you know, it's, it's a search problem. It's very difficult and annoying and you find them eventually. So these two little booklets and they're re they were really worn through. Everything else was nice, but these ones people, because the truth is in here. There's some great truth in here, right? There's this, uh, this beautiful mystery about uh, the universe, right? Biology has something nuts about it, you know, that, that, that we, we, can't, we can't explain maybe, you know, maybe God's behind it. I do want to say again that this three quarters means an inefficiency from my point of view. Right? So these bigger organisms are hotter than we might expect from a very simple story. Some people will say they're more efficient because they use more energy, but that's not right. That's, that's actually in a book I was just looking at yesterday, which is a well-known book about complexity. All right. Yep. Okay, so uh, these are really, yeah, crazy town banana pants stuff. Anyway, so, all right. So it's getting silly, right? It really is getting silly. This is really silly. Uh, so it's starting to spread. It takes off. There's this uh, meeting in Troon, 1964. There's a, it's a symposium, again, on, metab on this metab metabolism story. So it becomes the official exponent. This is how science works, right? And it was actually voted. So you can, you, th this is written down as a transcript at the end of this book. It's 29 to 0. And it's a funny discussion. People have some mad ideas about things, and then eventually they vote. They vote, and it becomes the, the exponent, <laughs> right? So they slipped up. The cabal slipped up because they actually published the conference proceedings, right? Usually it's like fingerprints or some dead bodies or something, and um, scientists, when they go wrong, they put it on the web. Anyway, so these guys publish the proceedings so you can see it in its full madness. Uh, it's this thing here. I, I think I'll... I, actually, I'm getting a copy. Yeah, yeah. So people who are knighted, obviously, right? Clearly a Freemason. Um, <coughs> that's slander. That's true, that's slander. Anyway, they voted. That is ridiculous. That is totally ridiculous. That is ridiculous. My God. All right. So it becomes the official exponent, and then it becomes the official scientific like mystery as well, because the biologists have said it's three quarters, so it is three quarters. It is three quarters. And there's, if you go back through the literature, and I... I've kind of always wanted to do this. You'll see a Kleiber's paper and, and Rubner's paper and a Kleiber, it becomes three quarters and everyone's three quarters, three quarters, three quarters. And then there's a few people saying, no, what, what are you doing? Like, this is crazy, this is crazy. But they don't, they cite everything that comes before them, but the three quarters ones are sort of just blossoming out, you know, they become a epistemic closure. That's what we're all about here, <laughs> it's good. All right, so did the truth kill a theory, right? So, I mean, was two-thirds a theory that was killed by the truth, the real truth? Or is it uh, the other way around, that we had a truth and it was killed by a theory, but not just a theory, perhaps not as much as a theory, maybe a, a lowly hypothesis, right? Just a hunch, just a lone hunch. Does it go away to the top to the National Academies of Science? The answer is yes. Uh, is it really dead? Is two-thirds really dead? I've just got these silly things. Could have faked its own death. Is it locked up in some sort of dungeon in Buenos Aires, chained to a radiator, maybe. And what kind of people would vote on scientific facts, right? I mean, it's just nuts. I can't believe I have to talk about this. 
This has been a big deal for me as a scientist because you know, it meant years of wandering around in the intellectual wilderness thinking, wow, this is wrong. I always thought it was about doing things the right way. But it turns out, particularly the further away, so you have pure math. Pure math is all about insane people doing things that, you know, you really, it's highly verifiable, right? We get, we've got to the age of computers, which has made it a little harder, right? So here's my proof, and it's like five million lines of code or something. But beforehand, you know, your personality didn't matter, right? The more nuts you were, the better, actually, because you just stayed in the bubble. You've got to stay in the bubble in pure math. So, but as you move further away from that, other stories get in there, and people matter, and sociology comes into play. So very useful it's been for me, studying, uh, studying the whole imitation contagion thing. And so I feel like I can understand it and bear the fact that this is, this is sort of became the gospel. All right, this, here's a book. So um, this is from 2001, I believe. And so Whitfield is a, was a, he may still be there, but he was a writer for Nature. And actually at the time, I guess I was, you know, so if you go back, there are quotes from me saying, being the, you know how you always have to have the, the opposite side, right? Uh, US newspapers love to do that, right? Here's da 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 da, and then, oh, but someone else said this, right? And it doesn't, it could be that they're like one in a million crazy people, like, right? Okay. So, um, but you just, it's good to have that sort of balanced view, yeah? But it's not really done properly, right? You need some distribution that says everyone believes this and there's one of them. But of course, we do know that a billion people can be wrong, yeah? So, all right. Um, <coughs> we know that quite well. All right. So lots of controversy. There's a nice book, you know, there's a mouse and an elephant. It all works. Um, I actually told him in the interview that someone should write about this. 1999, I think. And I, so I, he may not remember that, but I feel like I said someone should write a book about this because it's such a crazy history of science story. There's all of these characters, you know, Kleiber and Hoisner being friends, but being like this. Um, and, and you know, people making, <laughs> making stories up. So uh, he did, but he, he wrote it in a nice way that said everything is great. It's a beautiful story. We'll get to why that, what he was really writing about later on, because I'm, I'm just trying to tell you the history. Uh, so all right, this is, the, this is the paper that we produced that really sort of, you know, it's been well cited. It's, it opened up a whole can of disaster worms, um, sort of thing, that, uh, you know, where we really went back and looked at it. Um, and I'll tell you how this works. But we are the unbelievers. All right, so Hoisner, this fellow Hoisner, Fred Hoisner. So he's making his putts, I talked to him. He, uh, he went through the literature and, and got all this paper, uh, data out, published his paper in 1991. Uh, and we looked at what he did and we, read, we did things in a slightly different way. But, so you can't tell from these lines, but the, from these plots of points, and I'll show you some other things. Here is a cloud of points with, um, for, for mammals. Okay, so there's mammals. We've got elephants getting up to here. A couple of shrews hanging around down the bottom. Uh, it's in grams. Should say that, I guess. And this is resting metabolic rate. So the, I'll show you what this is in a minute, but that looks like two-thirds up there, that exponent. So the blue, the blue line is exactly two-thirds, the red line is exactly three-quarters. Hoisner's result was to say there are some statistical outliers, right? So, so now we get into the realm of crazy statistics. And you have people who love their theory saying, one of the big characters here saying quite in a, in a conference saying, I don't like statistics, right? Well, you know, depends what, if they're helping you out, right? Uh, so we have to look at this a little more closely. So Hoisner has this result that, yeah, some of these are outliers and you throw them away. Some people later on say ungulates are no good. Let's get rid of the ungulates. There are lots of rodents in here as well. You know, people have all sorts of arguments for why things should be in or out. But let's just look at this data set and see what happens. This is birds. So birds, so two B, this is a different, this is Bennett and Harvey. This is a different, this is different to Hoisner. Again, one of these agglomerations. So 398 birds, you get up to an ostrich, about 100 kilograms for an ostrich. Hummingbirds and those guys are pretty small. Um, so not quite as big a range. Yeah, this is more, well, six orders of magnitude. This is more like five. So this was a problem for the quarterologists, right? Because this is dead on two thirds, right? If you just put them all in a big thing and you, you run a line through it, you get two thirds. So that's a, that was a problem. The story is in trouble. You could say, well, maybe birds are different. You know, you could just graciously say, 
Maybe birds are different, but no, it's got to be three quarters. So they did this. They broke them into passerine and non-passerine. So that's perching versus non-perching birds. It's very interesting when you, when you, if you can take out subgroups, you can, I mean, we've talked about these scalings a lot, but there is this extra thing. If you do have subclasses, you can get all sorts of messy things. So if you do that, you kind of get fits like this that are 0.71 and 0.72, and so the day is sort of saved, right? But these are fundamentally different classes of, of birds. That's a good one. Well played. All right, so the cabal. All right. So let's try to measure these things. And, and people, I'll show you, you know, I'll point to what we've done. I'll show you many, many things that other people have done as well. But um, <coughs> we're going to measure, and then we're going to talk about theories. Uh, what was kind of, I'll come to the theories later on. And really, it was looking at the theories that made me in particular go back and look at the data because the data is always interesting, right? Why not look at the data? I mean, it's clear that after this, a few people were still looking at data, but the theory people, it's done. It's three quarters. The job is to prove it, right? And this is a beautiful thing to work on. They didn't look at the data. I mean, no one looks at the data anymore. That's what happens. All right. Okay. So I'll go through a few little... Uh, <coughs> You know, we've, we've looked at measuring these things. I'll show you. This is, again, slightly it's different to what we had before. I mean, it's true that it's really just a negative exponent, positive exponent, but it's a sort of a different game. We have kind of a nice thing because we have these correlated quantities on each axis, and, the, and it's a growth story. Um, so these are just good things to know about regression. So when you do regression, you are... Uh, let me try my spectacular thing. Go on, fail for me. Yeah. So when you do regression, um, you've got this cloud of points, right? And this is like happiness and wealth, and you want to prove that you're something. So uh, what you do when you do least uh, ordinary least squares is that you're mis minimizing these errors, right? You find the line that minimizes these, the, the square of these errors. So that's all very nice. What it's saying is that you believe there's no error in x. X is perfectly measured. That's really the assumption there. And the error is all in Y. Fair enough? So you can do Y on X. Wow, that's hard to see, isn't it? Um, you can do... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just having so much fun. Um, normal. How about normal? It's not focused, is it? Yeah, yeah. Cruel. All right. All right, fine. Um, so, but you get the idea. Well, no, oh, yeah, there it is. It's better. Nope. Shut up, duds. Okay, so that's so ordinary least squares. It's about, you're assuming the error is only in y, perfectly measuring mass. Oh, you know, the x, okay? Um, and you can do regression of y on x or x on y. And if you do x on y, then you're assuming that x has got the error. I mean, you can just flip this around, but it's an important thing to think about. The error is in x, and you're measuring y perfectly. You'll get different lines. And then there's a whole other bunch of uh, types of regressions. Okay, so we're assuming that measurements of a mass are, uh, have certainly less error, which is fair enough. You know, put the, you know, take your giraffe and put it on a scale with your clipboard and you measure it. And, uh, but then when you get to the whole like putting it on a you know, treadmill and trying to see what it's doing, that's hard. That's pretty hard, especially with giraffes. Uh, so there's some assumption about Gaussian errors because we, we know which dangerous things to do, but we do it. Um, so if we don't know anything about the errors though, right? if we're sh not sure about these things, then we have to be a little more thoughtful. Um, and if they're not, you know, they're not a, a dependent independent thing, it's more of a dependent dependent, then there's this, sometimes it's called RMA, I guess that's what we call it, reduced major axis, standardized major axis linear regression, uh, which is a very clever thing. But basically, you're assuming now that the errors, I'm wandering around, that the errors for a point are like this. You're not sure. There's some uncharacterized kind of error in each direction. And there are variations on that. I'm just sort of quickly saying that. But that's, that's the idea. Fair enough? So now you're going to... Okay, this. Now you're going to let it go loose in those directions as well. 
It turns out, and this is a very, there's a nice paper that I can point to by Rayner uh, that's a, in zoology, I think, from the 80s. Great, great paper, which goes through all of what I'm just trying to say now in a very nice detailed way. It turns out the slope of this, uh, this regression turns out to be just the standard deviation of the, uh, right? So it turns out to be just the standard deviation. There's some sigma x here, and there's some sigma y here. Right, so you measure those st two standard deviations, and you're good. That's pretty, it's an odd thing, but it, it does work very nicely. <coughs> it's very, very simple, scale invariant, which is important. Doesn't matter what the scales are. And it has this nice property. So the slope that you get from that regression is uh, equal to the normal slope that you'd get from just ordinary least squares regression divided by the... Um, Correlation coefficient, right? So if it's one, if a it's a per they're perfectly lined up, all of these things match up. If it's you know, a bad correlation coefficient, then this goes up. So that's an important thing to know. Ordinary least squares gives you this kind of a slope. This next, correlation, this next regression gives you a steeper slope. And then a regression of x on y will give you an even steeper one. So this is the correlation coefficient. So there's just this very nice connection here. All right, fine. So that's a useful thing to, to work on. All right, <coughs> just some side bits there so we know what we're doing. Uh, I think, in general, for some of this, it's fine to use. If we're measuring uh, you know, limb lengths and so on, we might be. It's a giraffe. The, um, if we're measuring limb lengths, then we might want to do uh, SMA, the standard major axis thing. Uh, but we think mass is measured pretty well, so we're going to do ordinary least squares. All right. That's a very good thing to know. It turns out, too, then, if you look through papers and they've done ordinary least squares, it's very nice work by Labo Barra on this, and they report a correlation coefficient, you can figure out what they should have reported because they should have done SMA. That's good. You just divide it by R. So it inflates all of the exponents. All right, so this is going back to that mammals picture, right? The, that diagram, we had all these dots, and I had uh, a two-thirds and three-quarters line, right? The twelfth. That's the difference. This Judas fraction. That's all it is. Um, so here is a, a very reasonable thing to do. Let's take the little guys, and then we'll take the ones that go up to some, you know, just a kilogram. Then we'll go up to 10 kilograms. We'll go, right, we'll work out. This is a logarithmic kind of increase. This is the number of individuals involved. So there are lots of little guys in there, because, of course, mice are very easy to measure. So let's look at the exponents and their errors. So we get 0.67, and that's clearly, so this is 2 thirds. This is 2 thirds, 2 thirds, 2 thirds. And then it starts to creep up. Right? When you put everything together, you get a 0.71. This is for that Hoisner data set, 391 um, uh, animals were involved. Right, So they're individuals. They're not averages for species, are they? They're individual organisms who are tested upon. So this, does, this one here actually doesn't include three quarters or two thirds. So this is a bit of a mess. Uh, so you know, Al, in the end, what we said was, look, um, Going out to 30 kilograms, it's looking pretty good for two-thirds, but something is happening for the big ones. Maybe they're you know, running around or something, or maybe they, there's something fundamentally different that happens once you get big enough that gravity starts to mess with you, and it's just harder to you know, keep it together. Um, but this is, this is two-thirds. <laughs> really, this stuff is two-thirds. Now, I did, years ago, I, I, sort of prese I presented this, and I said, well, why don't you do it from this end? which is spectacular coming from an ecologist biologist because um, you know, that's where evolution started, right? With the little things and made bigger things. You know? So you, there's no, this doesn't make any sense. Right, all right. <sighs> People, birds, birds, I said the whole thing. So this is regressing everything and that's the error, 0.664 plus or minus 0 0.019, 0 0.019. So you wanna, right? And so this was the perching birds versus non-perching birds. The, you know, the, Let's save it. So that's the whole thing. And of course, then if you take, again, this whole just evolution made bigger things story, um, as we march out, then it's, it's pretty good, right? Those errors all encompass pretty much um, two thirds. So the first one's bad. I think that's right. Yeah, so it goes from, you know, that, that's a 95% confidence interval. It's pretty, pretty awful, which makes sense. It's a very small range. Uh, so. This is surprising. So my wife and I, I my, my wife was driving, we were driving down to Nantucket actually years ago and um, had this gigantic Toshiba laptop and I put all this data in, which took a long time because 
uh, you know, these papers that I got this from had very nicely put in appendices with everything in there and all the citations. So I put it in there and I do some regressions. I'm like, oh dear, this is <laughs> really, really nuts. So, and uh, my advisor, Dan Rothman, and my colleague, Josh White, who was a, were PhD students, you know, worked on this for a long time. And it was definitely this kind of uh, Foucault's pendulum type situation. You know, Umberto Eco, right? Da Vinci Code is the comic version of that, or the, um, you know, the, the watered down version. But basically, yeah, going and finding papers in strange places and being kind of shocked by what you see, all right? Drawing the story out. So, but very shockingly to us, the data doesn't support the three-quarter story. You'll see that actually in the years since, people are all over the place with this now. New data sets, and then there's like, there is no exponent. There are three exponents. You know, it's really a mess. Um, <coughs> so here's a, here's a nice extra piece that we did, because we're like, oh, we have to really, really make this. Everyone believes in this thing. What are they doing? We have to be absolutely uh, sure. And the cabal is pretty strong and scary. Um, <coughs> that's why I'm wearing these goggles. OK. So what we'll do is we'll assume we'll go to hypothesis testing, because that's the right thing to do, apparently, in science. Um, let's see. So uh, just a simple thing. So we'll assume it's a particular exponent and see what's the probability that the data we're, we're looking at you know, agrees with that. Right? So there are a couple of ways to do this. Um, so we're going to fix we're going to fix this exponent. These are of course the observed pieces, and we have to then fit for our C, and we want to see how well um, you know how fit works. And if if from this from this law right, we're, we're we're sampling from this thing, could we produce the observed values? Okay, okay, we'll do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, we have this, so we're going to compute a. a we're going to compute p-values, and I'll show you the plots uh, in a bit, which are pretty striking, I think. Um, <coughs> yeah. P-values. OK. So yes. All right, so Kleiber. OK, let's do this is a full mass range. So there's only 13 here. Brody had 35, and I think we may have taken out the made-up ones. Hoysner's 391, the 398 for, for birds. Um, this is the measured exponent for all of them. So Clyber, I guess, actually is 0.738. Maybe I had 0.76, but 0.74 seems to be the thing here. So hmm, that's interesting. So the probability that it's two thirds, that this, these values could have been realized from two thirds, is less than 10 to the minus 6, right? This little data set did not come from, it's very unlikely it came from such an underlying law. That's true for Brody. It's true for Hoisner. It's not at all true for the, the Bird's one. The Bird's one is totally fine with a two-thirds, a pure two-thirds law, right? Not two-thirds and a bit, but two-thirds. Uh, Kleiber gets a, it's totally fine with three-quarters. So that's the only example. And this is where this great you know, religion started. Uh, that's the only one that, that agrees there. Um, Brody, not so good, actually. Hoisner, not so good at all. And certainly terrible here for, uh, for Bird's. So then we'll break it into different mass ranges. And again, this is, we're talking about really mammals, so I'm going to get rid of the Bennett and um, Harvey stuff. So for less than 10 kilograms, and then greater than 10 kilograms, we'll, so the Kleiber data set is very small, but it splits into these two pieces of five and eight. So if you look at the little guys, they're on the two thirds thing. So that actually beautifully agrees with the much bigger data set that Hoisner has, even though it's only five, just the raw exponent that you get there. It's fantastic, right? Um, th so that's very, we're very happy that it could come from two thirds because it's such a small data set, while it could have come three qu from three quarters as well. Um, <coughs> Brody doesn't seem to work, but it doesn't seem to work for either of these. So it's really this one that's in between. Uh, the Hoisner data is fantastic. And there's absolutely no way it comes from a three quarters uh, rule. Good. And if we look above 10 kilograms, because we're thinking maybe there's some sort of scaling break, which we don't, you know, I don't think, I don't know if that's true, uh, but we've got to do the right thing. So you see here for, for Kleiber, what happens is it, it does seem to have this two thirds, three quarters thing going on. Wow. So, uh, so definitely not from two thirds. The p value is very uh, relatively small, but certainly from three quarters. 
Brody seems to agree with three quarters in this upper mass range, 0.76. Hoisner's is very high, so that just doesn't agree with anything. That's, that's, it's really taking off, right? Hard to see in all those points, but basically it's taking off above a, you know, and this is getting towards the, I, I mentioned this the other day, right? The exponent for things when they're running around as fast as they can is more like one. You put out your, your full power. So maybe that's what it was. All right. Other things to look at, right? So you can subtract out, this is for, uh, this is for um, the, the Hoisner data for, um, for, for mammals. So you subtract out the, uh, so you find the residuals, right? You subtract out the, um, the line of best fit and then look at the errors. And so they, they fit reasonably well to a Gaussian. So that's a very nice thing, right? So you, might, you would expect that. So this is in log space. There's a, and you can write it out like this if you want. But there's a, a decent Gaussian fit. And if you want to, uh, there are various with this chi-squared test, but Kolmogorov's Monoff is an excellent test. It has nothing to do with vodka. It's to do with very smart people. OK. So that's a, that, that passes as well. So it feels good. That feels good. Um, <laughs> one more test. So we're really going to uh, get into this. So we're going to look at the residuals, right? So if you, if you made a bad fit, OK, let's make a bad fit. OK, so here, here are your, um, your points. And, and you make a fit like this. You just do a terrible fit. So the errors are going to be like this and here. And if you subtract out this line, uh, the errors are going to be this, like this sort of thing, right? So they're going to actually, if you looked at these errors, they're going to have a positive correlation with, as you go along the x-axis. Fair enough. So you want, you want your fit to be such that when you subtract away the line, you want something that's much more, the errors are just all over the place. They're nice and higgledy-piggledy. And if you try to find a, the, um, the correlation for this guy, it would be zero. Right? Good errors. There's nothing. I mean, it could be a little funny, but basically you, you want your errors to be nice and random, right? How are we doing? Yeah? OK. I'll work on that. <coughs> so now we're going to presume an exponent of 2 thirds or 3 quarters. So we're just going to sit in there. And then we, we fit the prefactor, because we have to still do that. And then we look at the residuals. So we're going to get out our rule. So this is going to be 2 thirds or 3 quarters. We fit that. And we subtract this off. Um, from the measured log of the, uh, the, um, the uh, basal metabolism. And so we get all these errors. And so, just as I was trying to say there, so our first hypo our basic hypothesis is that res the residuals are uncorrelated. And then we reject them if we, you know, they're, they're significantly correlated. And so we simply measure the correlations, and we compute a p-value for that. And a really nice way to measure correlations and be very, very happy, happy about your p-values is to use uh, Spearman. So this, maybe some of you know this is Spearman rank correlation. Heard of this guy? Yeah. So Spearman rank correlation. It's really good. It's a spiffing Spearman rank correlation. Uh, so here's the idea. You, you've got these x's and y's. They're, they've got some crazy numbers, right? And you rank them. So you take all your x values, and you say, OK, this is the first one, the second one, third, or, and the nth one is the biggest one. So you just rank them. You do that with the y values. And so if they're perfectly correlated in the Spearman sense, then when you look at their ranks, they'll go one, two, right? They'll march up. So this is actually a test of monotonicity, because you just simply need that they're growing or decreasing. Right? So this is not a straight line fit anymore. It's a very nice thing. It's a bit weaker, but basically it's a, a measure of monotonicity. And you can calculate the correlation coefficients, the same thing, but these are now the ranks of the uh, things you've measured, rather than their um, actual values. And because now you're looking at 1 to n and the permutations of 1 to n, right, we don't need to know what the underlying distribution is. Now we can actually do very, very nice mathematical stuff, and we can estimate the p-value. We can write down a formula for the, for the p-value, given the scrambling of that permutation. Right? So if it ends up as 1 to n and 1 to n, we get a uh, correlation of, of 1. If this thing is all randomized, right, it's just a big mess, then we should get 0. And we'll be able to, we don't have to, it's, it's, the, the good word here is non-parametric, right? We're not assuming Gaussians. We don't have to assume anything because we've turned it into a 1 to n, 1 to n problem, right? 
We're, we're now dealing with uh, correlations between permutations. Okay, it turns out that is a beautiful thing. All right, so it's mono, it's a increase or decrease. Uh, monotonically gives you perfect correlation. So that's good. So it can be, you know, like this, all sorts of things. It doesn't be a straight line at all. Um, <coughs> just some more about it. So if you want to come back, but this is the good, this is a good thing. This is a wholesome thing to use. This is a good people thing, okay? Um, you can figure out that students' T distribution appears. That's the, that's how this um, correlation that you measure should be distributed. It depends on the total number. Uh, it's non-parametric, as I said. And, okay, all these words. Uh, very nice. This is a funny, this is a funny, if you haven't, if you don't have this on your shelf, it's a good thing to have on your shelf. And you can get all the PDFs of chapters online. It turns out these, these, are, bit, these are from a way back, but numerical, numerical recipes books, you don't really need to look at the code, but the two or three pages that precede the, the things that they're talking about are fantastic. They're beautiful little descriptions of how to do things. So this is, you know, there's a little section on uh, correlations, and it has a really nice write-up of Spearman. It's also the Wikipedia. But this is, you know, it's here. You can do it. Really nice. Just really well done. <coughs> Come on, thing. Thing has died. Why did it die? Okay, so we're going to use that. I know, this is extra stuff. Wow. All right. Um, all right, so... Yeah, this is pretty nuts. So we have uh, four pieces here. This is for mammals less than 3.2 kilograms, less than 10. Again, it's reasonable to do. Evolution produce these things as they grow. Less than 32, and then all mammals. <coughs> okay, so we're going to vary the exponent. We're going to say, let's have an exponent of 0.6, and then we're just going to index all the way up to 0 0.8. We're going we're to search through all exponents in that range. And for each one, we'll get a p-value based on this correlation of the residuals, right? So we'll fit the line, we'll subtract it off, we'll get the residuals, and then we'll look at whether they're correlated or not, right? The picture I was just drawing here before. So <coughs> this is uh, 0.05, this is 0.01, so they're the typical statistical significance lines, right? Um, that's what they're indicating. So this is... For the smallest uh, set of mammals, it's up to 3.2 kilograms. There you go. So it's already rejecting three quarters pretty harshly. And you can see um, <coughs> we have a nice, happy range. So you would you'd be kind of OK with this. You're very OK with this range. But it's peaking around 2 thirds. Moving out to 10 kilograms, you see the same story. I and mean, this is just absurd. I mean, we had to do this to just say, please, people, look at what the data says. Um, that is two-thirds. This one, two-thirds. Three-quarters is over here, right? This is plummeting away to, to, uh, you know, into this abyss of statistical disaster. Um, this one, you still see a squeaker. It, it pops in there. It's not so unhappy. Two-thirds are still hanging around. But we have this story that that data set, something seems to be happening for the, for the larger organisms. Various stories about it. I don't know. Yeah? So do you believe me? <laughs> That's what science is about. It's about belief. All right, okay. <coughs> These are numbers, these are data things. Okay, amazing, kind of a mess. You have died on me, haven't you? You traitor. It says cabal on the back of it. Cabalware. Ah, oh, betrayed. Okay. Birds, we already know it's two thirds, but this is just to do the same thing. Uh, it's a slightly different range. Again, it sits around two thirds. Um, I mean, here it's a bit of a mess, but it moves beautifully as soon as we get out to enough, enough birds. We stick enough birds into our data set, big enough range. So three quarters is not really in the game. Okay. So uh, I probably mentioned these before, but it's good to just say it again. Uh, there's a, and some of you know about this, but there's a very nice piece of work. It's using a different approach. It is the kolmogorov smirnov approach by Klausett and co. Well, all of these people I've mentioned, I suppose, in various points along the way. Uh, and, and Aaron has a nice uh, page that he's um, put together on this so you can get some code. And I really should do that for this stuff we did as well. But anyway, that's a, that's a nice piece of work. So they have lots of things, you know. Here are all these distributions that people think might be power laws and, you know, craters of, 
craters on the moon, also, you know, the sizes of such, all these things, wealth, whatever, and then they have a story of, as to whether they're reasonable fits or not. Okay. All right. So disappointing. Um, I do have another battery. Okay, so... Uh, all right, so not so bad. So, so we've seen these things. So um, two-thirds is great for birds. It's great for mammals up to maybe 30 kilograms. Maybe there's another scaling regime. There's some weird things floating around. Economists, there's a paper from 83 talking about a break in the way limbs scale when you get to 20 kilograms and above, which starts to make sense, right? Gravity is starting to be you know, a thing that matters. Um, but... We'll get to this on, on Tuesday, um, maybe. Uh, here's, a, here's an odd thing. So if you, it depends how you think about this, but basically non-isometric growth. So allometric sh growth of shapes, right? So we're getting, so we're not getting spherical cows or nice ellipsoid cow cows that are scaling up. They're stretching or getting fatter in some way. You know, differentially, they're really growing allometrically. That actually, and so the intuition here, that actually leads to a lower scaling, right? So that doesn't give you a higher scaling, it gives you a lower scaling. And the reason I want to say, there, there is an intuition, there's a very simple intuition. So imagine you have, you have your sphere growing, um, that's a real 3D thing. That family of stuff is really 3D. But imagine now you start off with a, um, a you know, kind of, a, kind of a, a small sphere, but that it doesn't grow very fast in this direction, but starts to really spread out. So it becomes kind of a big pancake. More and more is it, and eventually, you know, this dimension is just growing. It's growing, but it's growing slowly. You know, maybe it's growing like, you know, instead of volume to the third, it's growing like volume to the tenth, and these other guys are really taking off. Eventually, it's more and more of a pancake. So it, it looks more, that family is more 2D than the 3D thing. Right, so that's going to be the story. If you move away from isometric growth, you move essentially into a sort of a lower dimensional kind of family of objects. Somewhere between two and three, for example. And that will change your surface area, the way your surface area grows, and that will lead to other stories about uh, metabolism. So evil. I know there's a battery over there. Oh, God. Um, all right, so there's more fighting that goes on since our work. Humorous, ridiculous fighting. Uh, nope. And so we have this, we have White and Seymour. Now it's just a mess, right? So this is 2005. They find two, so they find two thirds. They get this estimate. They, they get rid of some herbivores from the data set saying that they were badly measured. I don't know. Uh, there's a paper by Glazier in 2006 saying it's not universal. Now we're going to look at so, you know, things near, near the, in the sea. Um, all sorts of good stuff beyond the three quarter power law. Variation in intra and it's, uh, and then there's 2008. Uh, this one's pro three quarters, right? Problems, they, they say it's a finite size scaling story. Okay, really, really. And there's just so much, there's so much. And in fact, I think I, I don't have it here. So I'll, I'll mention it later on. There's a whole, uh, yeah, it's in the theory section. There's a whole, functional ecology in 2004 had a whole issue devoted to this, but it was more about, it's about theory as well. And that has some papers with funny titles that I'll come to. but. Uh, just just a, a mess. No one knows what's going on. All right, so for some reason, this is also connected to river networks. And we'll get to the, why that is on Tuesday. I've mentioned these guys as we've gone through the, the, uh, the course a few times, and you've seen this picture, right? So one of our basic things is this drainage uh, basin area, right? A, the whole thing. And we have some length of a main stream, or you could think of the typical the overall length and maybe the width as well. Uh, that's an L parallel. So you might want to think about how these things scale. You look at some landscapes, right? They're beautiful things. You see them from space. Rivers have all these nice fractal things going on. And so you imagine, and they're within each other as well, right? So we have this smaller basin here as an example. So if you take this guy out, turn it around, and scale it up, is it an isometric scaling that you do? And you have lots of tiny little ones as well. There are all these little ones. Do you scale them isometrically to get the big picture? What do you do? So there's Hack's work, which I've mentioned. So this is back in time. This is 57. This is just measuring things. He, I think it's 0.59. He had something close to 0.6. Uh, 
Uh, and so what we would call anomalous scaling, right? We'd expect this, we'd expect this exponent to be a half, right? This is the, the length, a length scale and an area. If everything's normal, it's, um, we have uh, dimensional scaling, then we'd, we'd expect a half. So people find between a half and 0.6. It's another big story about finding something crazy, right? The half one is boring. Everyone walks away, right? The theorists don't need to do anything. Uh, so those initial studies were done on small scales. So here's a piece that appeared in 1992 in Science. Uh, Bill Dietrich is a very, very famous, um, uh, I have to be careful, you have to be very careful, geomorphologist, I think, geologist. You have to be, geologists don't like the geomorphologists because they just think about the crust just a little bit. Geologists are, you know. Um, <coughs> and then the geophysicists are just out to lunch, right? So, okay. Um, yeah. I'm, not, I'm just saying how these people perceive each other. Uh, all right, so let's see. So fantastic uh, orders of magnitude here, right? So this is an area, which of course grows fast, but this is 100 to 10 to the 13, um, 10 to the 1 to 10 to the 7. This is a delicious looking scaling, right? Log, log, plot, draw a line through it. And this is the line they find, 0.49. Kind of a half, right? So, um, so that sort of, you know, the Hack study was pretty small. This is big. This is sort of the whole world, right? So. Oh, and it's a mixture. It is a mixture, and that's fair enough. This is uh, not just one basin. This is all sorts of things. It's a mixture of um, you know, many, many different locations. But pretty strong evidence. This is a plot. Actually, I think I made this, but it's from, a, this, it's, it's from Leopold, 1994 uh, paper. And this, this is the uh, taking the world's largest basins, just the, the largest, right, the, the largest version of them. Um, and not looking about it, at any of the little ones inside and comparing them across. So, of course, there's all sorts of landscape issues, you know, geology doing funny things. And, um, <coughs> yeah, the old orogenesis, right? Uh, orogenesis. It's good stuff. Lots of names like Vermont, Montana, Oregon, right? They want to get the whole mountain thing in there. Um, <coughs> okay, so... These are, the, as I said, this is, you know, so the Mississippi Basin will be in here. It's one of these things. This is actually the Mackenzie uh, River in Canada, which is anomalously um, uh, wide. It's incredibly wide and, and short, right? So, uh, but this again, so 0.5, right? Plus or minus 0.06. There's some error on that one, but so that seems to be, right? We had two thirds for this other one, a half for this one. There's going to be a connection. So I'm just going to tell you about some, the start of some of the earlier theories, because we have to get into these guys. And uh, I can't tell you everything about them, but just uh, we've seen some madness. Here's some more madness. There's lots of madness. I, haven't told, I mean, I've told you a little bit about it all, I suppose. But um, this is a paper that appeared in the Journal of Theoretical Biology. It just flat out says, well, what if biology is somehow four-dimensional and we don't understand it? Because uh, the two-thirds that we're getting from this uh, you know, this heat loss thing, well, it's really 3 div minus 1 divided by 3. That's where it comes from. So one, if it's 3 quarters, then obviously it must be 4 dimensional. Um, <coughs> I've got to add some more to this. Yeah, but that's, and that is really, it's just a little, let, let me talk about this for a while. I have this idea. I will talk about it. I'm just going to talk about it for a couple of pages. There's no other thing, you know, it's just like, Sort of somehow it's four-dimensional. Maybe the physicists could help us out. <laughs> what could go wrong? All right, so that's um, obviously rather um, peculiar. But it just pops up. So part of the point of this is no one understands this three-quarters thing, right? No one has really a clue. So it's sort of, as I said, crystallized by a vote in 64. Uh, but people had been thinking it for, you know, since the 30s. So no one has a theory for it. There's this one. So McMahon, I showed you McMahon and Bonner's book, um, excerpts from that. Uh, this is, a, and, and so this is part of the book as well, but it's uh, work that was published in Science. Uh, and he has this idea of elastic similarity. And it's a surface area idea, right? So, it's a, it's, so if you have, uh, as I was saying before, things that are not growing isometrically, then their surface area is growing differently. But actually, that's not really true. Um, but there's an idea maybe for trees that uh, the shapes are scaling allometrically themselves. So it, and I, th I have to check, but I think this is true for trees, right? So that they're, um, they're, 
the girth is scaling like uh, the diameters are scaling like a uh, power of three eighths of the volume, and the, the height is going up slow. Is that really cool? Hmm. Anyway, so uh, you know, looking at uh, animals, you find it true in some cases. Ungulate legs appear to have this scaling. Okay, that's not all organisms. Um, uh, but it's hard to, it, so the shape and metabolism story is not really connected. So I'm going to say that, um, I'll show you later on that if you do try to connect the surface area properly, um, because of this fact when you're, if you, so you have your sphere and it's not scaling the same way in every direction, right? You're making a bigger and bigger pancake. It's really more of a two-dimensional thing. Then in that case, the volume is really scaling um, the surface area is starting to scale more like the volume, right? So you're getting this funny thing. There's a lot more heat loss with that. It's a, it's a, it's a bad situation. Um, but it, it, will, it will mess with the, the way metabolism scales. All right, so that's a, it's an important piece, but it's never really connected. Again, just kind of an idea. And I'll just introduce this, and this is what we'll talk about on Tuesday. There's work in the 60s. I believe it's, it's a little funny, but it's floating around. So it's Ryshevsky, who's an interesting character in uh, uh, quantitative uh, biology or mathematical biology, University of Chicago. Um, so he talks about blood networks and finds two thirds. But this is the paper that really changes the game, right? So it's 1997. There's Jeff West, and, uh, so, who was a particle physicist at um, Los Alamos. So he's going to be right, right? And then uh, a couple of ecologists, Brown and Enquist. And uh, so, so here was, and this is a picture, this is from a science paper, uh, which, so we'll go into this on, on Tuesday, but I just want to tell you, so here's the idea, it's about networks, right? So we've, we've talked about the network thing, so it's about nutrient delivering networks, and that's how it's going to connect to rib networks. It's a beautiful idea uh, that you've got a heart back here pumping away, and it's delivering things, you know, this material out, to the capillaries. Uh, and as a consequence, they claim, they claim a number of things. One is that for this supply to work that you would end up with a pure fractal, fractal um, tree. So that's kind of a funny thing. But uh, there are a couple of pieces in here. So there's a flow through here. There's, you think about these tubes and so on. Um, as you get smaller, the, the radius gets thinner, right? The, you know, the radius goes down. The length changes in a certain way. Uh, it's true that the flow has to slow down eventually, so that's a difficult thing that, that they had to contend with in this paper. It's a very difficult paper to understand because it's been so beaten down into such a s small amount. And that's where things get a little messy because it turns out mathematically it doesn't hold together, but it's very hard to see that. Um, <coughs> blood has to slow down, actually, because when it gets out to the capillaries, right, you're down to sort of the, the width is very small and the cap... The, the uh, corpuscles coming through are just really tiny, and then they start to throw out some some good stuff uh, through the through the uh, through the through the uh, membrane, right? And then they speed up and they come back to the heart, essentially. But so it's really two delivery. You can think of it as a supply and a, uh, a you know a kind of a, um, a a collection network, which is the vein structure. All right, so that's the. Big idea, right? So they say, well, how do these things run? Okay, there's a heart beating and there's energy being distributed through a network. So what does that mean about a system that's being supplied by a central, that's the thing, you're being supplied from a central source, right? It's not like you have little, you know, energy sources all over the um, organism, which we try to do with the Boeing, right? We try to put little energy sources everywhere. Damn it. Um, good idea. But uh, we run on this centralized source thing. So this is where it all takes off because this is a beautiful story. It somehow gets three quarters. It doesn't. It just doesn't. It doesn't. It's a disaster. Uh, but three quarters by this point is enshrined as a true fact about biology. They somehow come up with an answer for it. This was reviewed. I'll tell you a few more things. It was reviewed by nine people at Science. It was very controversial just getting through that process. And uh, I think someone re resigned from the editorial board as a result. Um, there was a lot of furor just from the, from the start. So, and it just remains controversial. Not to me, but it remains controversial in general. And so uh, Tuesday, we're going to chew into this guy and, uh, and some other great theories, and then we'll get into 
A simple, simple argument for how this works. All right, <coughs> if I survive the weekend, okay. Cabal, cabal issues. All right, people. <laughs>